Welcome! This tutorial will focus on the 3D model prerequisites for CNC fabrication. Make sure that you save your 3D model in a separate file, in this case suffix with CAM, Computer Aided Manufacturing. Make sure that you have saved your 3D model with everything that you intend to CNC fabricate included, but with everything else excluded. So that the only thing that we have in the model, select everything with Ctrl A, is what we intend to CNC fabricate. Make sure that the model unit is millimeter. Millimeter is the unit that the CNC will accept as input. Make sure that your whole model is scaled to fabrication scale. In this case, the model is scaled to 1 to 500. So all of the dimensions here, if we do a bounding box, corresponds with 1 500th of the actual dimension. Make sure that the model is situated at the origin. If we change to the shaded display mode here, we find here that the bottom corner of the model is situated right at the origin. If we temporarily hide the landscape here, we see that the model is situated in the positive x and y quadrants with the corner precisely where the x and y axis meet. Make sure that the model is oriented in such a way that the long axis is aligned to the x axis and the shorter edge is aligned to the y axis. If you have a square model, this of course does not apply, but make sure that any fiber direction of your chosen material is parallel to the x-axis. For CNC fabrication, the topological requirements are not as rigid as with 3D printing. Here you don't need everything to be one closed polysurface, you can have several different objects, but there should be no vertical gaps. As for the landscape surface, it should cover the whole area of milling and not have any holes straight through. It is entirely okay that a building model is separate from the landscape model. The landscape surface may be a single surface or, as in this case, a closed solid polysurface. No matter whether you have a single surface for landscape or a closed solid polysurface, you must take into account a minimum bottom margin of 5 mm. Including the bottom margin of a minimum of 5 mm, the model as a whole must be of a reasonable size. If we select everything with Ctrl A and type bounding box and do a bounding box, we see here the dimensions of this particular model. 1155 mm along the long x-axis, 555 mm along the shorter y-axis and 75.67 mm along the z-axis. The model size should be reasonable in three ways. With regards to the machine workbed size, where the Z axis is often the most constraining one, for the large machine, no model with a stock larger than 100 mm in thickness or height can be possibly milled. The CNC machine will freeze if it is programmed to go further up. The smaller WorkBee CNC machine has an even more constrained Z dimension for the work area, 35 mm. In this case, with regards to the machine workbed area size, this model is suitable for the large machine, with the height being accommodated by the 100 mm work height, as well as being able to be placed on the workbed. The second way which the model has to be reasonable in size is with regards to material dimensions. Depending on the material chosen, this will of course be more or less problematic. If you are making a board of solid wood, then you are very free to define the stock dimensions. But if you choose XPS as material, the XPS sheets come in predetermined sizes, 1185 times 585. And with the asymmetrical flange circumscribing the sheet removed, then the dimensions are like this, 1155 times 555. It is possible to join several XPS sheets together by gluing them onto an underlying board, but there will always be a seam. The third way which a model has to be reasonable in size is with regards to actual milling time. Different materials have different physical properties, such as relative hardness, making it more or less possible and suitable to mill aggressively or conservatively. So what would be unreasonable to mill in model size for one material would perhaps be very reasonable to mill in a softer material. If one is predetermined for one specific material and having to adjust the model so as to be able to mill it in a reasonable time, the easiest way to get a nice result in reasonable time is to reduce the size of the model. 
Usually, if you reduce the size of the model by 50%, it gives an expected milling time of only one-sixth of the original time. Of course, this is a drastic example and often you don't need to reduce the size to half, but the example still showcases that there is very much to gain from reducing the size, even by a fairly small amount. Of course, it is not an easy feat to approximate the time it takes to mill a specific model of a certain size in a certain material, but when you get as far into the workflow that you simulate your generated toolpaths, then the simulated time, although deviated by a certain time factor, make sure to take that into account, but when you are at that stage in the process, you can approximate the time it will actually take to mill. If you find during that stage that it is unreasonable in terms of milling time, then you should always be open to go back to the model stage and redefine the size of the model so as to yield a more reasonable milling time. Holding Ctrl and Z to undo the bounding box, we can now look at the model itself. Depending on the material chosen and the scale, including building models with vertical surfaces, might be more or less suitable. Generally, the router bits that the CNC uses, as opposed to more vertically oriented drill bits or more horizontally oriented handheld router bits, CNC router bits generally are best at defining the surface in a diagonal sort of way. Often when trying to mill vertical surfaces in a hard material such as solid wood, the surface gets very rough and is prone to splintering. On the other hand, in a relatively soft material such as XPS, there is not enough hardness in the material to result in chattering or micro vibrations when the router bits engage in the material, so vertical surfaces are not as deteriorated. Whether you include buildings as being part of the CNC fabrication process, or if you add them separately afterwards, is a choice to be made depending on material and scale of the model. And if they are included, make sure that they are correctly placed in the vertical z-axis with regards to the landscape. If you have a problem with the vertical placement and do not have any other points of reference, then you can utilize this grasshopper definition. Let's just arbitrarily move them upwards here and then open this. Let's make sure that our landscape is referenced here. And then we select all of the building volumes here and we can do it preferably here with the selection, select objects, and then we can just right mouse and click and set multiple reps. And for this projection to function, it takes a lot of time. Uh, for these relatively few buildings, it takes two minutes. Make sure to determine beforehand if there are a lot of buildings, perhaps not use this because it might be too computationally intensive. If you are determined to project, then press play here. All right, with all the points projected here, we will utilize the lowest of that point to move the geometry to that position. So we can simply right mouse and click here and bake, and then we can bake as a group in the default layer, that's okay. And then we can double click in the window bar here, and then we can type cell last to select the last selection set, which is the previously generated one. And then we can actually move these objects to the building sublayer and simply select those and delete. Now the buildings are placed in the vertical Z axis with regards to the landscape so that they do not float above the surface. If the buildings should be included, they can be left as is. But if we, as an example, would mill in solid wood and would not want these to be milled since the predominantly vertical surfaces of the geometry will yield a much more inferior result than if done by hand, then we can make sure that the building footprints get descended pockets. So let us just focus on these. We can ungroup these, Control shift g and select one of them, zoom selected, ZS to zoom to selected, zoom out a little. Then for the vast majority of this, this would be okay as is, but here we see that zoom to selected, that if we would make a descendant pocket out of this geometry, then the pocket would not accommodate the whole building footprint. So in this case, we can zoom out a little. We can do like this. We can select this. We can move it upwards, perhaps 25 millimeters. We can click in the void. We can do extract surface. Now we can do extrude surface. And then we can select the bottom surface and enter to confirm. And then we can do delete input no, and then 25 millimeters down. And then we have a separate one here. And now we see that we can make a Boolean difference to carve out this geometry instead of this, which would leave a significantly smaller footprint than needed to actually place this building model in the landscape model. 
Boolean operations, we are going to do a Boolean difference subtracting the building geometries from the landscape geometries. It requires that you work with solids, so in this case a solid polysurface as landscape and solids as for our buildings. All 26 closed solid polysurfaces and also including this we can make sure to change that to the building layer as of now. Now Boolean operations are very computationally intensive. Let's save. And then we can select the object that we want to subtract volume from and do boolean difference. And then we can select all of the buildings and space render to confirm. Boolean operations take a long time, so be sure to have patience and save before. In the first stage, Rhino computes the actual boolean operation. And in the second stage, it generates a new preview mesh or render mesh for the modified geometry. Both of these stages can take quite long. Having done a boolean difference, let's hide our buildings and we see here that now we have proper pockets for all of the buildings and as we define it in the grasshopper definition we have at least one millimeter of inset amount. Depending on the curvature of the surrounding surface it might be much much more than one millimeter but there should be at least one millimeter. Let's see what we have here. We have 0 0.9 millimeters, that's within tolerance. All right, then we can show the buildings again, and then let's make sure that this, that was only a boolean helper, so to say, we can hide this, and then we move down this, what was it now, negative 25. Very good. So we see that this can be properly placed here. One thing to take note of is that even though one does this workflow with, um, in, with pockets or insets or vertical insets, the concave corners, that is for these rectangles, all of those corners which have an angle of less than 180 degree, will have a residual radius left unmilled. That is because all of the router bits are cylindrical in nature and now with this arbitrarily sized representation of a router bit, we see here that even though it manages to define this edge and this edge, this specific concave corner will have a radius left. It is not a strenuous undertaking to use a chisel to chisel away and to straighten the corners in solid wood or simply a blade cutter for XPS. Let's delete this representation. So if we would CNC fabricate a model with vertical insets like this for the building footprints, then it's exactly this model that we export. As for this tutorial, we can simply create a new sublayer called Pocket Insets, change the layer for this object, and then we can hide this layer and show the previously one. And then we can also show the buildings. One thing to take note of, let's hide the one with the pocket insets, is that no matter if you want as an end result a terraced model with millimeter height steps, as an example, or if you would prefer a smooth model like this, then it might be a good thing to still use a smooth model like this as the input, because then you can, with great flexibility in Fusion 360, define if you would like a terraced end result, the vertical step down for the final toolpath. Thus, if you have a smooth model like this, you can define it for the final toolpath that it has a vertical step down of, let's say, one millimeter. And then if you find that the toolpath time takes far too long to be reasonable, then you can with great ease change that step down value to perhaps 1.5 millimeters. If you would prepare a 3D model with predefined terraced steps, let's say in one millimeter intervals, then if it would be beneficial for you to reduce the time it takes to mill, then you perhaps would be restricted to doubling the interval from one to two. Because if you would do one to five step down with a predefined terraced model with one millimeter steps, then the generated tool path will yield a non rhythmic end result. So for flexibility's sake, it might be good to use a smooth model like this. If you do have a terraced 3D model, and if you are determined to CNC fabricate a terraced model, as long as the time it takes to mill is reasonable, there is no drawback. But a smooth one will always allow more flexibility. If you want to include curves in your model to engrave with CNC fabrication, make sure that the curves are projected so that they are tangential to the landscape surface. Do not position the curves lower than the actual surface, since you will define the axial offset in the Z axis in Fusion 360. And if you know that the curves are projected to the actual surface of the landscape, then it is easier to define the axial offset as a depth, so as not to confound yourself when determining a suitable depth. 
if you have curves that you want to engrave in different ways, in this case, we have a real estate line that we want to engrave with a V-shaped router bit, thus yielding a V-shaped groove going along the property line. While we want to engrave the roads with a flat end router bit, so as to give a rectangular groove or inset along the road curves. For proper export to Fusion 360, it is important that the curves are polylines. It says here that these are curves, but they are actually consisting of small straight segments. In the fabrication scale, the segmentation is not liable. If you have yet to project, then it might be easiest to simply use a grasshopper definition that both projects and converts to polylines. These two grasshopper definitions you are able to download if you go to your preferred web browser and then you can enter gh or grasshopper.kthcnc.se and then you can go to definitions and then you can go to the subfolder fabrication and to the subfolder project buildings and curves for CNC fabrication. And here you have the two grasshopper definitions along with respective previews of the same. So let us select all of the polylines that we already have projected and move them up arbitrarily here perhaps and then we can reset the Z scale to zero and then we can open Grasshopper and we can enable the solver and we can change to project curves onto landscape. The landscape surface or solid should be defined here, set multiple preps. And then as for the curves to project, make sure that if you have different subsets that you do it separately. So we can start with the property line so select that one, or we can simply right mouse on the click and select sublayer objects, and then we can right mouse on the click here and set multiple curves. For the polyline conversion, we'll allow a tenth of a millimeter of deviation. And then we can bake this. And we can bake it to the default layer, that's okay. We can just click okay. And then we can double click here to minimize the window. Then we can actually delete the curves that we projected and then do cell last and select the curves that we baked and then move that to the proper layer here. Now this is adequately projected to the surface. Very good. We'll do the same for the roads. Having projected those, we can bake them, either as a group or not as a group. And then we can delete the current selection and do cell last to select the previously generated selection sets. And we can move those to the layer roads. Very good. So now these two are projected onto the surface and converted properly into polylines. When exporting, it is important to remember that Fusion 360 will not accept both curves and 3D models in one singular file. So let us first hide the polylines and then select everything and then export only the poly surfaces. Let's do 2406.10 underscore the name of the project. In this case, we can also include the material that we intend to use, as well as any further descriptor. We'll input an index number here, so as to be able to properly sort this afterwards. And then we make sure to save this as a Rhino 5 model file. It is historically what has worked best in Fusion 360. And then we can save it. And then we can hide the landscape and the buildings, and then we can show the polylines. And then we can select everything, and then we can export. And here we can simply select this, so as to get this, from the start, and then we can change to an AutoCAD drawing exchange, and we'll keep the same index number and the material there, and we can actually just add polylines. Here it is important that you export with the 2007 lines export scheme, and OK, and now you have properly exported this. Very good, you can show the other layers. Now you have properly exported both the 3D models as a Rhino 5 model file and the projected polylines as a 2007 lines export scheme AutoCAD DXF. It should be noted that for the DXF, the layer hierarchy is retained, which is why we exported only one file containing both the property line that we will V-engrave and the road lines that we will separately engrave with the flat end bit. It should also be stated here as a conclusive remark that of course you can omit any curves to engrave and also buildings at all. It can be pure landscape model as well. It is not necessary to add either pockets for the building models or the building models themselves or any curves to be engraved. Now you are ready to move forward with a specific Fusion 360 tutorial that is relevant for your specific outsets. Good luck and thank you for your time.